in all definition, in all ways, it's an outflow or an overflow of the love that you have for God. Okay, that's what worship is. We express it in many different ways. It's not just singing. It's not just coming to a service here today. It's not just, it's a whole bunch of things. When you're sitting at home and you're thinking about how awesome God is, that's worship. When you're driving down the road, maybe you decide, you know what, instead of listening to country music today, I might put on a little K-Love and get my praise on, and you're thinking about how awesome and amazing God is, that's worship. Maybe you get up in the morning and you're sitting there thinking, man, I just love God and I love what He's doing in my life, and I love what He's doing for my family, and you're just thanking God, that's worship. Because worship is your expression of love to God. That's what it is. I think sometimes we overcomplicate things. But the great commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, body, and soul. We have talked about all of those. We, we talked about, and, and here's what we looked at last week, just a quick recap of the diagram. So the center bullseye is the will. God gave you free will. You can do whatever you want to do. Doesn't mean it's always beneficial, right? It's not always beneficial. You can do whatever you want to do. You have free will. So what happens is you, your, your will wants to make decisions, and it wants to make good decisions. Well, then your heart gets involved. Your heart is the seat of emotions, right? So this is where, where your feelings, your emotions, and your passion. So guys, I know that you don't want to deal with feelings, and you don't want to deal with emotions, but guess what? You are very passionate. Men are passionate about the things that men are passionate about. There's a lot of things. We can be passionate about cars or hunting or fishing. All kinds of things. Food. I'm passionate about food too. You know, I'm just saying. So, um, but so you have your heart is about your passions and your hearts and your emotions, your feelings and your emotions. Then you have your mind. This is where you are logically um, calculating and analyzing and all kinds of information. So then you come to, so, so what happens is then you have your body. Your body, none of these desires or passions or emotions or thoughts are carried out without the body. Can't do anything without the body. So the body is what fulfills them. So in your heart, you might be sitting there after you, you kids are going to go eat some pizza, am I right? Oh man, that sounds so good. Can I be like an honorary, like FFA member today? I mean, I'm just saying, you know, I, I think there should be like, you know, like I could be a kid, really. So after you guys eat your pizza, then all of a sudden they're like, hey, do you guys want some like cinnamon sticks? And so then you're like, well, deep down inside, maybe you're like, I shouldn't. But then your heart says, well, I want to. I'm pretty, pretty invested in this. I'm passionate about those cinnamon sticks that I really need right now. And then your, your, your mind is like, well, you know what? You know what? Here we go. If we could run three miles when we get back, I could probably go for some cinnamon sticks too. And then the body's like, no, but my taste buds are screaming for this. What happens is what I'm wanting you to understand is to make a decision, it includes your heart, your mind, and your body. But have you ever made a decision in your life where um, you got exactly what you wanted, but you wasn't happy in the end? Anybody? Like you got the dream car, but it really didn't make you happy. You got the girlfriend or the boyfriend you always wanted. You're like, man, if I could just get that girl to like me, I'll be happy. And then you realize, I ain't that happy. <laughs> or vice versa. I'm just saying it works both ways. That door goes both ways. Or you get your dream house. <laughs> and then after you've been making payments on it for about a year, you're like, what was I thinking? I'm having nightmares now. I mean, so what I'm wanting you to understand is a lot of times what we think, we have these thoughts. If I could just get this, if I could get that new bow, if I could get that new tree set, if I could kill a big buck, that was, that was like a long time. I was like, man, if I could just get a big one to put on the wall, you know, but here's the reality. Those things don't make you happy, and they don't make you happy because your soul is not satisfied. You have a heart, mind, body, and soul. Your soul is only satisfied through God. See, God loved you so much that he put something in you that only wants him. No matter what you get, you could, you could have the entire world, you could have everything that the world has to offer you, and you still won't be happy because your soul isn't happy because the only thing the only thing your soul wants is God that's it your soul was created by God for God and when it's not about God you're still not happy 
And we just don't get it. We're like, man, if I could get that raise, if I could get that car, if I could get this house, if I could get that girl, if I could, if I could, if I could, I'll be happy. And yeah, you're happy for a little bit. Like when, when Barbara says, you know, hey, we're going to have lasagna tonight. I'm like, woo, I'm happy. And then I eat the lasagna and it's over. I'm like, man, <laughs> can we do that again tomorrow? Can we double down, you know? So what I'm wanting you to understand is that, that, that the soul is the most important part of you. Your soul, in fact, we, we looked at a passage last week in Matthew 16. It says, if you were to gain the whole world, yet forfeit your soul, what good would it be? What good would it be if you got the whole world, yet you forfeited your soul to get it? Well, so really, if we start looking at this, well, haven't we talked about it all? I mean, you know, if you missed last week, go back and it's there on Facebook or wherever you want to find it. But we kind of start thinking, well, we've talked about worshiping with our heart, mind, body, and soul. What else is there? I mean, we should be technically done before now, but I have a fourth Sunday, so I had to preach about something. <sighs> or maybe there's something that we haven't yet talked about when we we're talking about worship. See, many of us don't really understand our soul, but at the same time, we don't understand our spirit. Did you know that you had a spirit? You have a spirit. The problem is you have a soul and you have a spirit, and a lot of people thought they were the same thing. And, and maybe some of you are like, oh, wow, I thought it was the same thing. I'm telling you there are two different Greek words used in different places all over the Bible. You have a soul, you have a spirit. Spirit uses a Greek word pneuma, which literally means breath. <sighs> That's... So when we're dealing with spirit, it's not something that you're going to see. It's something that's flowing through you, and you can't even explain how it works. But it is there anyways. So today we're going to talk about spirit. So there is, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to get deep into that yet, but I want to show you that there is a difference. Six times in the New Testament, Paul makes a reference to my spirit, not the Holy Spirit, separate my spirit. So, in fact, we just talked about deacons. The first deacon, Stephen, preached his first sermon in Acts chapter 7, and he gets stoned to death. Harlan, where are you at? Are you in? Uh, could you preach for me next week? Everybody bring a rock. I mean, so, Stephen preached his very first sermon, and as he's being stoned, okay, this is what he says. Lord Jesus... Receive my spirit. That's what he says. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He didn't say receive my soul. He said receive my spirit. So you have a spirit. And most of us sitting in here probably don't even understand how it works. Or anybody interested to see how they work? Is anybody like, man, I'm going to really... Okay, rest of you, sorry. So... There is one passage that really speaks a lot about worshiping God in spirit and in truth. It's in John chapter 4. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. I'm going to recap a lot of the story. Jesus is traveling, and as he's traveling, he drops, stops into a, a town of Samaria. He's tired from his travels. He sits down by a well. He sits at the well, and here comes a woman in the middle of the day. She's doing that to avoid all the people because she's not living the kind of life that the public admire. So she's staying away from the crowd so that she's not... Um, Fingers aren't being pointed at her. She's not being harassed. So she's hiding from the people. And she comes to get water. Jesus says, would you get me a cup of water? Could I have a drink of water? She does not give him a drink of water. She more questions him. Why are you even talking to me? And he says, well, if you knew who it was that was asking, you could ask me and I would have given you living water. Then she says, well, she still doesn't give him a drink of water. He's still thirsty. But now she says, well, are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well? He says, anybody who drinks of this water is going to be thirsty again, but anybody who drinks the water that I'm going to give him is never going to thirst again. She's like, well, I want that water. She still isn't giving the guy a drink of water. Are you serious? This guy's thirsty. Still hasn't given him a drink of water. He says, well, everyone that's going to drink this water is going to be thirsty. Anybody who drinks my water, she goes, forget about your water. I want what you got. Still doesn't get it. I, don't want, I want your water so I don't have to come here anymore. I want what you have 
the water that you're going to give so I don't have to walk out of here and be embarrassed. I, don't want, I want to walk out here and, and I want to never have to come back and face people again. He says, well, go get your husband. She says, well, I don't got a husband. He goes, oh, you're right. You've had five husbands, and the one you're with now is not your husband. She says, oh, let's not talk about my sin. I see that you're a prophet. I mean, this woman, I'll tell you what, she is really good at skirting the stuff. She's like, I'm just going to move right around that. We're not going to talk about this. So she gets to this point. She goes, oh, I see that you're a prophet. Now we're going to get into another discussion. And that's what today is going to be about. So here's what she says to him. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews claim the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. So this is the first thing that she brings up. Jesus answers her, and we're going to look at the answer in just a minute. But he says, woman, believe me, a time is coming and it has now come when we will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. What, what the first thing that he's going to do, she's focused on our ancestors. This is how we've always done it. This is how it's always been. So it's been handed down the line as a tradition that we are to worship on this mountain. But you say that our worship is no good because of where we're at, and so you say that we're supposed to do it in Jerusalem. Jesus is saying, I'm saying neither. Worship is shifting from a place to a person. Now here's one of the things that I, I often say. It's not about the location. But we get caught up in that. In fact, most of us, many of us, find our identity on where we go to church. Oh, I go to church. I worship at Living Water, or I worship at this church, or I go to that church, we find more identity in the building we're worshiping under than in the person we're worshiping. Don't we? You see, see, one of the things that I keep seeing is that, guys, this building is not a church. It's actually a lumber yard. I mean, it doesn't look like a lumber yard right now. But it was. It's just a building, guys. It's literally four walls, a bunch of sheetrock, some spray foam. We painted it black so that you wouldn't notice it. Now you guys are going to be like, yeah, that is spray foam up there. Put a bunch of bright lights so that you can't see it. You know, I mean, so the thing is, is that, that this is just a building. It's, it's a place to keep you out of the rain. It's out of the cold or out of the heat. This is just a place. It's just a building, but worship isn't about where you go. It's about who you are worshiping. So then Jesus, as he replies, he says, Woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. What I love about this is that he goes now, so he shifts from location to person, and now it's the person of worship that we're dealing with. So now he's identifying the person. See, here's what's interesting. Why didn't Jesus say, hey, woman, we're going to worship the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords, the great I am, the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. I mean, that's how I, if I, if I was, but I'm not Jesus, <laughs> clearly. But that's how I was, that. listen up, woman. We're worshiping the king of kings. You better get ready. He coming. No, he says, we're going to worship the Father. Why does he talk about the Father here? Isn't it interesting? I mean, he doesn't use the word that they would have really known, the, 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 the Samaritans would have really um, accepted Elohim. It's their word for God. Well, we're going to worship. A time has come where we're going to worship Elohim. No, he doesn't say that. He says the Father. So then you've got to begin to say, well, why? Well, she said, are you greater than our father Jacob? And our ancestors here are told us how to worship. And what he's doing is he's kind of linking a reference of what she's been talking about in this conversation. And now he's linking a commonality that's going to be bigger than what her, her idea of father Jacob and ancestors, what he's about to unload on her is bigger than any of the ancestors she's ever worshipped under. Well, the second thing that he's going to do is this. You have to realize this. For God to be a father means he has what? Children. 
Think about this. You cannot be a father without having a child, right? So what I love about this is that he's telling this woman, he's like, hey, the father. So immediately she's like, okay, so we're worshiping a father. So God is a father. That means that he has to have children or he wouldn't be a father. Then it begs the question as, am I one of his children? Could, could I be one of those children? In fact, some of my favorite verses in the entire Bible is when it talks about how God lavished his love on us that we became children of God. When you start thinking about God didn't have to, God could be whatever God, God is God. He doesn't have to do nothing nice. But God is like, I love you and I'm going to make you my child. I'm going to love you like a father. So some of us sitting in this room, you might have had a terrible father. But I can promise you this, there is a father who is good. We have a good, good father who loves you and lavishes his love on you and he wants you. He chose you to be one of his children. So when I start looking at this, I'm just like, this is so amazing. But the last thing that I want to bring to your attention is, is that this also is going to link in the future teachings of Jesus as he refers to himself as the son, the son, and he's always talking about God as the father. He's linking that I am the son. Uh, and, and he also said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? That whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You see, one of the things that Jesus is doing is he's opening the door of what real, true worship is going to look like. Children worshiping their one true living Father who's in heaven. That's what worship is. So, so he brings all this out. She's thoroughly confused, I can tell you that. Up to this point, Jesus really shows her a lot of grace. <laughs> a lot. Um, this woman was very difficult to work with. Shocker. Right, guys? Shocker. A woman being hard to... I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm teasing. I'm te oh, man. Sorry, Jackie, we're not going to have an offering today. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. So here's the thing is that, so this woman was making it very hard for Jesus. Every time he would say something, she shifted the conversation, and she was wanting to attack the Jews a whole lot, and she was trying to find validation for the way that she was doing things. And, and Jesus kept being very polite and gracious. But I want you to know something. Even though that he has showed so much grace, he now, in this next verse that we're about to look at, draws a hard line in the sand. You see, Jesus offers complete grace, but never at the expense of truth. You see, a lot of people think, you know, we have this new age movement that's called the progressive church, or progressive Christianity is not Christianity at all. If you find yourself seeing these things about progressive Christianity, it's not. What it does is it takes half of Jesus. Well, you can't, if you worship half of Jesus, you're not worshiping Jesus at all. So this progressive movement says all we want to do is focus on Jesus' love, grace, and mercy, and compassion. And that's, that's what it is. That's all of Jesus. We're going to ignore everything else. Well, here's the problem with that. Jesus himself said the truth will set you free. So you're going to stay in bondage, and you're going to stay stuck in life until you face the facts, receive and accept the truth and make some changes in your life. You following me on that? So the thing is, is Jesus still loves her. He's still gracious to her. He didn't, he didn't stop talking to her when he realized that she's had five failed marriages and living shacked up with somebody that's not hers. And so the thing is, he could have said, yeah, we're done here. No, his grace and his mercy and his compassion and his love keeps driving him because he loves her. He wants her to get this living water. He wants her to have it. But she keeps ignoring the facts. And now Jesus draws a hard line in the sand and he says this to her. You Samaritans, worship what you don't know. That's a tough statement. We worship what we do know. Now I will tell you this. 
the rest of the book of John, Jesus is hammering the Pharisees because he's like, you don't know me and you don't know my father. He's not referring to all Jews know what they're worshiping. What he's saying is those who do, like we Jews who know what we're worshiping is because we know who we're worshiping. Because it's not about the place, it's not about a location, it's about the who. So there's some of us who really do know, but you Samaritans worship what you don't know. And a part of the problem was this, the Samaritans rejected all the prophets who talked about Jesus. They worshipped through the, the, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, and then it stopped for them. They, didn't, they did not worship, they did not, they did not receive the prophet Isaiah or, or any of the other, anything outside of those five, first five books. They did not accept any of it. And yet they still knew through the teachings of Moses that a Messiah was coming. That's what's so amazing is that everyone talked about the Messiah. So they still knew he was coming. But he says, you worship what you don't know because you only have half of what you think you know. That never happens to any of you kids, right? You kids never, it's like you guys know everything all the time, right? That's the problem. So, so he tells her right out of the gate, you worship what you don't know. I want you to think about this. If worship is our expression of love, right? This is our expression of love to God, okay? Then how can I truly love God if I don't know Him? Right? Parents. Any parents in the room? <laughs> okay? You know your kids, they fall in love. And you're like, you don't know what love is. I say that all the time. Like, oh, I love him. You don't know what love is. Amen, parents? Come on, where you at, right? All the kids, after two weeks, two weeks, I love him. You don't know what that is, kid. Right? Because you don't really know his motives yet. And I'm going to be watching for him. I'm going to watch him like a hawk. That's right. Watching you. So the thing is, is that, you know, what you tell kids all the time is like, you don't know that yet. You don't know what it is because you can't love someone you don't. All right, we're getting it. She's worshiping God, but she doesn't know who God is. So what I'm trying to let you know is that if we don't know who God is, then we don't know how to worship yet. We're just getting ready to get started. All right. All right, so, so, he, uh, so, so anyways, yes, so what we have to do is get to the point of knowing him. Let me, let me share this passage with you right here. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. <whistles> right? That's pretty tough. He says, but the one who does, so the ones who are just saying it, yeah, God, God, I believe in God, I believe in God. A lot of people say that. Did you know that the Bible says that even the devil believes in God, right? I can promise you the devil's not going to heaven. He's not going to be there. There's a whole special place for him and all those who are going to follow his ways, all right? But what I'm wanting you to know is that not everyone, so this is what Jesus is trying to, he's trying to let people know something really important. He says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, so there's a day that we're all standing before God. He says, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? Now, I'm telling you, Man, there's going to be some people who said, man, I preached your word. I taught Sunday school class. I went to church every single week. And he's, and he's going to say, depart from me for I never. Oh. See, it's not about where you go and it's not about what you do. It's about who you know. Salvation is not a prayer that you're repeating and hoping to get in. Ch salvation is not because you attend church. It's about who you know. Hmm. Jesus does not leave us hanging in our story with the woman. He tells her, but the hour is coming. So he kind of changes his, he's, he kind of gets on to her pretty good. You worship, you Samaritans <laughs> worship what you don't know. That probably w w did not set real, real comfortable with her. And now he changes his, his, and now he's going to explain what he means. 
he says, but the hour is coming and now is. So right here, now is means that it's, it, it's here now. So right now for us, that whatever he's about to say is for us because this isn't a past tense thing. He says, it's coming, but now is. So this is for us. This is about worship, and it's for us here today. When the true worshiper, see, he's now defining true worship. True worship. This is what true worship is. We'll worship the Father, so we know we're wa- worshiping the who, the Father, in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him, God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. Whew, this is good. Alright, so here we go. God is spirit. The Greek word for the word spirit is pneuma. When we talk about, when any time that Paul talked about my spirit, or Stephen says, receive my spirit, same Greek word, pneuma. It's not just for the Holy Spirit, it is also for your spirit. Because how can the Bible say, receive my spirit, if we don't have a spirit? So I'm going to explain how this works. It's kind of like marriage. Oh, oh. Oh, oh, help us. <laughs> it's kind of like marriage. So, the first marriage, Adam and Eve, he, he, he makes Adam fall into a sleep. He takes from Adam this rib. He makes this woman. Adam says, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken from man. And the two will become... Good, you know your word. That's good. One, the two become one. So here's the deal. I infuriate my wife because I'm an idiot. <laughs> I'm not even going to lie about that. I'm an idiot. She infuriates me because she's absolutely crazy. <laughs> but her crazy is beautiful for me. Country song, you guys, you, you, okay, I was just seeing if you're, all right, all right, okay. Okay, so for you guys on this side of the church, so, <laughs> so, Here's the deal, though, is, is when we said I do, it was till death do us part. So we don't talk about divorce. We talk about murder sometimes, but not divorce. Because um, that you know, because the only way for us out of this is if she dies or I die. I'm going to start reading her journal immediately after the service. Um, but the thing is, is no matter how infuriating we could be to each other, she is an extension of me. See, when we get married, the two become one. She's an extension of me, and I'm an extension of her. You guys get that? Beautiful. Marriage is the most beautiful thing that people on earth can do. We're saying, I want you to be my extension. I want you to be a part of me. And I want to be a part of you. Being one is not a sex thing. It's a oneness thing. So... When we get saved, all right, so John chapter 3, the chapter before, chapter 4 that we're in, Jesus is telling Nicodemus, you must be born again, for the Spirit gives birth to spirit, right? Okay, and we're going to keep going here, so don't, don't lose me. So in Ephesians chapter 1, when you're saved, it says that we we're sealed or, or we're, we're sealed with this Holy Spirit. So we receive this spirit. But I want to take you to Ephesians chapter 2. And it says this, as, for, as you, he made alive. Okay, listen, he made you alive who were dead. So understand this, you were a walking person, you had a heart, a mind, a body, a soul, but you were dead. You were dead spiritually. Okay, understand, you were dead. So, as and you, he made alive who were dead. 
You were dead in your sins, your trespasses, in which you once walked according to the course of the, this world, according to the prince of the power of the, the, the devil. You were following him in his ways, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, whom you also were once conducted yourselves. So he's saying, you used to be all of that. You used to be a child of wrath. You used to follow the ways of the devil. But he says, you were dead. Now now check this out. The very next verse. But because of his great love for us. Because of God's great love. So because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our trespasses. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. This is amazing. See, your spirit was dead. It was dead. We were lost in our sin and our trespasses. The wages of sin is death. So our spirits were on a one-way ticket to hell. But God, who is rich in mercy and love, when we came to him and we received him into our life, he made that dead thing alive. That thing that was dead is now alive. Now, I want you to see this. You see the green highlighted? And God raised who? So, Paul's writing this to the church. He's not dead. He's writing this physically with his body. So, and he's speaking to the believers in Jesus Christ. He's speaking to all of those who've been made alive. So those who have been made alive, made us alive, it's the same us. How many of you have been made alive though you were once dead, right? So most of you in this house has been made alive. Now check this out. And God raised us up with Christ, the same us as the ones made alive with Christ and seated us with him. Who? With him who? God the Father. We're seated with him. God the Father in what? Heavenly realms. We're seated in heavenly realms. I didn't write it. If you don't believe me, pull out your Bible and look. I put the Bible verses right there. Here's what it's saying, and I hope that you get this. Your spirit was dead, but it's alive. And our spirit that's alive is actually with him in heavenly realms, praising God and worshiping God right now. Isn't, I mean, isn't that remarkable? When I, when I was reading this, I'm like, hold on, hold on. I like back up a minute. And I'm looking at that and I'm like, how can I re- read this differently? I've never thought of this, not until yesterday, because the sermon changed yesterday, by the way. My wife was working and doing a shift and I was sitting in a hotel room. <sighs> what am I going to do? And I'm looking at this and all of a sudden my mind goes, Zoop, and it looks at that and I'm like, whoa, that's got to be a misread. Us. Us. Who's us? Okay, well, that looks like it's me. Seated, how can I be in heavenly realms when I'm right here? My soul is right here because it has to keep control over my, my body and my mind and, 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 and my heart because they're all a mess. I mean, like, so my soul has to stay right here keeping this all integrated with God. So then what's the part of me that's in heavenly realms seated with Christ up there? Isn't that, like you think about it right now, your spirit is seated in heavenly realms with the king of kings right now. If that doesn't get you triggered, if that doesn't like start going, whoa, and I told, I told my Sunday school class, I'm like, I'm going to probably say something. You're like, I've never heard this before in my life, and I hope that you go back and check it because this isn't the only place that talks about being seated in heavenly realms while you're still alive. How in the world could that happen? My body can't be there right now. My body's here. It's stuck in time and place, but there is a part of me that's not restricted here because it's a breath. Spirit, pneuma. Now, so then I'm hoping, as you guys are all like, I don't know about all this guy, 
I don't know about this guy. I'm hoping right now that you're, you're, you're really struggling with this because I want to show you Jesus prayed for this. In John 17, John 17, he says, I do not pray for these alone, but those who will believe in me through their word. He's talking about you and I who believed upon the words of, of the disciples, okay, that they all may be, what? One. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, listen, that they also may be one in what? Us. He's saying, well, here's what I'm praying for. I'm praying that their spirits will be one with us as we are one with each other, that they're one with us and us with them and them and us. So here's what he's saying is that this is just like marriage. My spirit was dead because of his love. He made it alive. And now he then poured his spirit into my spirit. And now it's one spirit. And I'm not God. I'm not saying I'm God. I'm saying that my spirit that was dead was made alive. And now it's one with him. I'm struggling. I can see it. I can see it. Some of you are like, I'm never coming back again. I want you to go back and read it. That's what I want. I want you to wrestle with this all week long. Because if God's word, I'm just reading it, guys. You guys see that, right? I'm not like twisting. I'm reading it. It's there. Read it. In fact, before I finish the sermon today, there was actually about four verses in four different places that I did not have time to get to this week. I thought, if the church would like and said, man, I need to hear more of this thing next week. How many of you would like me to teach on this a little bit more next week to more of you? Okay, okay, good. So next week, I had about four that I could not get into the time frame of our hour and a half. So we're, we're getting ready to do our intermission time for all of you who have never been here before. Get a drink and then get ready to come back in. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. They're like, oh, we're going to pizza, and let's slip out during the intermission. No, there's, we're almost there. So here's the thing. When we're talking about all of this, how I, I, I ask lots of questions when I read the Bible. So I'm like, how can this be? That's what I ask all the time. How can this be? How can my spirit and, and that, and how can all this work? And that's where John, John 17, that, that God wanted us to be one with him. And the only way, like my flesh is not going to be one with God. My flesh is the part of me that dies and doesn't come. Guys, when we are raised from the dead, you're not, it's not going to be land of the living dead. When this body dies, I don't want it to come back. Anybody with me? Right? I'm like, I don't want that to come back. I want a new one. Well, guess what? That's where the spirit comes in. What do you think raises that which was dead, it's our spirits that we're dealing with. And then God's going to give us an incorruptible. He's going to give us a new body that doesn't waste away. That doesn't have pimples, right? I mean, you know, that doesn't lose hair. I'm just saying. <laughs> Getting a little personal. So he says that we're going to worship in spirit and in truth. So let's talk about the other side of this. Truth. The word is aletheia in Greek, and it means true or truth, which is exactly translated that way. But truth can be revealed. So this is some of the things that Paul and John use this word as something that's revealed. So truth is constantly being revealed. Revealed is... There was a fly. I was about to get in a fight here. So there was... Now I'm distracted. Stupid fly. Um... So, yeah, right, squirrel. So, there we go. So, truth. It's something that is revealed. That means that there was something concealed, like in a present, like in a, in a box that was under the Christmas tree, and there's something in it, and you're about to reveal what's concealed. Something's concealed inside, and now you're about to open it up, and, and it's going to be revealed at that moment. See, this is, when we come to church, this is what should happen, is hopefully, if your preacher's doing his job right, hopefully he spent enough time with God to bring some kind of truth that's like a revealing of something you didn't know before. Which then makes it all exciting, right? Church should be awesome and exciting, going, I didn't know that, I want more. That's what this should be about. I'm hoping that, that that's what happened today. And so what happens is worship is revealing truth. 
Listen to this, the unveiling of Jesus. As we get to know him more and more. So here's, here's how love works, children. Not because you're like, oh, that boy is so hot, or that girl, she's fired in frog's hair. I mean, you know, you know, the whatever. Here's the thing, yes, she's pretty and, and he's cute, whatever. Um, but, but as you get to know each other, and you begin to learn about each other, and you begin to be revealed by knowing, like, you start figuring things out, you start learning things, you, you learn how they grow up, and what they, what, they, what they value, and what they love, what they like, their favorite color, all of these types of things. The problem that with kids today is, oh, you're so hot, I want to kiss you, and I want to kiss you, and then they start kissing, and the only thing that's revealed is things that shouldn't be revealed. They're not getting to know each other at all except for all the wrong ways. So here's the thing when we're talking about real love, it's because I want to get to know you on a deeper psychological, emotional level. You guys getting me? All right. Youth, they have not heard one amen out of any of these kids. Pray, parents, pray, pray. So here's the thing, is, and, and so what, what I began to see happening is here, he's telling us what true worshipers are all about. True worshipers are worshiping in spirit. That means that my spirit is, is connected one with the Holy Spirit. So my spirit gets excited when the Holy Spirit shows up. How many of you, when you walk into this house and you know that God's on the move and he's doing something, there's something inside of you that's stirred? Anybody know what I'm talking about? And you feel something being stirred around you. That's worshiping in what? Spirit. Your spirit is being stirred because the spirit is stirring. Have you ever sat in a church that was deader than a doornail? And you're like, I don't feel nothing. Anybody, right? You've been in some of those places, you didn't feel nothing, right? Because there's no spirit movement, your spirit can't get to the moving. Because it's a, it's a, it's a, I got to worship in spirit, so I need to show up where the spirit's moving. I want to be where the spirit is because I want to be stirred inside. And the truth, I'm going to worship in truth, means that I am, I want to know more about God. I want to know more about Jesus. I want to know more and more and I want I want someone to reveal something to me. I want I want a, a sweet principle, a truth of God's word to be uh, uh, packaged up and I want it to be I want I, I want to be the every Sunday, every time I open up the word of God, I want it to be like Christmas morning. And I open up and something new is Guys, I had my Christmas morning yesterday morning. When I was looking at that very verse, and I'm like, whoa, hold on. Seated with God in heavenly realms. I've skipped over that, but I'm, I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it. So, so all of a sudden, this is over. I'm, I'm like, whoa. So my spirit gets to go there and hang out with the Father. I didn't know my voice could go that high. I'm going to try out for <laughs> soprano. I'm coming. Soprano. Hi, soprano. I'm doing it. Man, guys. Is that not exciting to know that, that there are times where maybe there's a lot going on here and I just need to go sit in some heavenly realms? Hmm? Isn't there some of those days that are really dark and really difficult and you just need to say, God, I need, I need to be out of this place right now. I need to go sit in some heavenly realms where there is never a defeat. I need to sit in the light of God's word. I need to sit in your presence. And I need to, I need to sit like Mary sat at the knees of, on her knees before Jesus. I need to be on my knees before the king who knows how to deal with all the stuff in my life. You see, the father is seeking such worshipers. He's seeking worshipers. Those who will sit with him in heavenly places. And want to unveil his son to each other. The father seeking people who want to unveil Jesus together. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that amazing when you start thinking about what worship really is? 
is that he wants to connect with that thing inside of me that I don't even understand, but I can't wait for it to happen. And I get stirred up. But guys, you don't have to just get stirred in the spirit on a Sunday morning. This can happen just you and him on a Monday morning. To be that kind of a worshiper, that is who he seeks. So I want you to bow your heads with me today. What I want you to do that's so vitally important, my friends, probably the most important part is how this all starts. Your spirit starts off dead. When you were born, your spirit was born dead. You had free will to do whatever you want to do. You have this heart that's passionate about different things. You have a mind of its own. You have a body that desires to follow your head and your heart around. You have this little voice within yourself that God put there that seeks Him. There's a piece of you called the soul, and it so desires God. It screams out to the rest of you, please, Come running to God. And it's so hard. It's so hard because when you're spiritually dead, you really are wanting to chase after the world and everything that the world has to offer you. And you've, you've been walking through life ignoring that little voice inside of you. You've put your soul behind and told your soul to shut up and be quiet. And, and I don't want to do that. I don't want to. And it keeps begging you begging you to surrender your life to God to the Father who loves you deep down inside you know that you've been running and running and you've been doing all these things and you're chasing after all these moments of happiness but never actually getting satisfaction the thing you're missing is the Father. That's what your soul wants. The day, the moment you turn over yourself to Him, He brings to life the Spirit in you. I have people who ask me, Daniel, how do you know you're saved? Because there's a thing inside of me that's alive that once was dead, and I know it. You may be sitting here saying, I don't know if I'm saved. Oh, you'll know it. You'll know it. Because something that was dead is made alive. And once it's alive, you can feel the presence of God around you. Many people sitting in this room right now can feel the presence of God. Some of you sitting in this room can't feel the presence of God because your spirit is still dead. You may know something's going on and you may feel really good in this moment saying, wow, I haven't felt this good because God is in this house and in this place. And he's probably sitting in the heart of the person sitting right next to you. And you wonder why when I go to church do I feel better, but when I go home I don't. It's maybe because you're sitting next to saved people, but you haven't got saved yet. Maybe this is that day for you. As you're bowing your heads, you're closing your eyes, I want you to ask yourself, am I saved? Have I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior? I know I've done wrong. I don't think anybody in this room would ever claim to be perfect. I've done wrong. I've sinned. And maybe you're carrying around all that guilt and all that shame. Maybe you're sitting in this room and you don't feel good enough. That's exactly what the devil would want you to think. But God loved you. 
so much that he sent his son to die on a cross for you. For you. His love for you. And he wants to come into your life and make you whole. So I want you to ask yourself, have I given my life over? Have I asked God to come into my life? And maybe you have and nothing happened. Maybe you were really close, but maybe you just didn't quite come to that full place of surrender. Maybe there's something you're still holding back. With every head bowed and every eye closed, here's what I'm asking. If you have not Ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. And today you want to. Just slip your hand up in the air. Say, today's the day I want to give my life to Jesus. Praise God. One young man raised his hand. Is there anyone else? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Someone took the pressure off of you. You don't have to be the first one. But if there's anything inside of you saying, I want to be alive and I know I'm dead right now. I don't want to live like I'm dead anymore. And I don't want to be dead anymore. Slip your hand up in the air. Don't be afraid and don't be ashamed. This prayer that I'm going to pray with you is not a, it's just a prayer that gets you started. So I want us all to do this together. For the few that have raised their hands this morning, we as a family, as a church family. So we're all going to pray this together, if you're willing. Dear Jesus. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe that you rose from the dead. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I ask you to come into my heart. Live in me. Make me alive. Come live your life in me. I give myself to you. Thank you, Jesus. Every head bowed and every eye closed, keep it closed. Those of you who prayed that and you asked the Lord to come into your life, I want you to stand up right where you're at. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Praise God. Praise God. Stay standing. This is an amazing moment where you give yourself to God and you ask Him to make you alive. This is something to be celebrated. This is something to be happy about. That everything you've been carrying is gone. So what I'm going to ask now, you stay standing. Now family, I want you to look up and I want you to see who gave their life to God. And I want you to give praise. Jesus told us in his word, he says, if you confess me before others, then I will confess you before the Father by you standing and not being ashamed of your newfound faith. Jesus right now is telling the Father your name. As we do every week, We're going to open up this altar. And this altar's for everyone. Maybe you've had a tough week. 
Maybe there's been some things going on and you need to lay some things down. Maybe you, I, I loved how one lady came up and she says, well, you always tell us that if we got stuff to lay down to, to come to the altar, but what about the, those that want to lift things up? I said, amen, sister. If you want to come and say, God, I just want to praise your name for what you're doing in my life and in my family. But I'm telling you, there is something amazing when we get out of our comfort zones and we're willing to kneel before the king of kings now you can do that right where you're at you don't have to come up here but if you come up here one thing I can promise you from the church of living waters you won't be alone brothers and sisters don't come up here and stay alone very long you're gonna have hands all over you and praying for you because that's what we believe so I want you to know the altar is open you want to lay some things down or lift some things up you come on you lay it down or you lift it up. But this is that time for you. For you to respond to God. This is your time with Him.